On April 15, 2012, I was flying home from a conference, and on the first leg of my trip, somewhere between Tucson and Las Vegas, I died. Now, this wasn't an actual emergency. My heart didn't stop, and the plane didn't crash. But for a second or two, the light switch labeled Catherine McLean simply turned off. Right afterward, there was a moment of relief, total freedom. But then the panic set in. I knew there was no going back. This definitely wasn't one of those blissful near-death experiences. When I stepped off the plane, everything seemed strange and unreal. My heart was racing, and my palms were sticky with sweat. I felt like the volume had been turned up on everything, and it was difficult to orient. Now, some of you might be thinking that's just what the Vegas airport is like. I know. <laughs> But I was convinced I had died for real, so I was sure I'd made a big mistake. You see, I'd been practicing meditation for about 10 years at that point, and in the classic Tibetan text that describes how to navigate death and whatever comes next, they talk about bardos or places where you can get stuck. So I resigned myself to this terrible hell realm of slot machines and permanently hungover travelers, until I remembered that I could try to make a phone call. So I called my husband, who, to his credit, totally kept his cool. And confirmed that I was, in fact, still alive, and that I just needed to make it through the rest of my journey, and all would be fine. Except it wasn't. For months afterward, I felt like I was stuck somewhere between the worlds of the living and the dead, like the plane experience had failed to neatly finish me off. The ground under my feet felt fluid, and sometimes, when I looked in the mirror, I saw a sickly corpse staring back at me. On the worst days, I was sure that not only was I dying, but I was also going crazy. And my only disappointment was it was taking too long. But on the best days, I gave up trying to understand what was happening to me, and just enjoyed myself. I forgot about the plane and my obligations, and my previously sane life. I forgot how to be afraid. And that was when the world opened up. In those moments, everything and everyone around me became so beautiful and perfect I could hardly stand it. Anything seemed possible, and I felt lucky to be alive in a world of shiny wonder. In other words, for most of 2012, I felt like I was on a pretty hefty dose of LSD, which brings me to the real point of my talk: psychedelics. The whole airplane incident happened about two years into my four-year stint as a psychedelic scientist. Now, some of you might not know this, but psychedelic scientist is a totally legitimate job to have. <laughs> Although psychedelics have been illegal since the early 70s, researchers at major medical institutions like New York University, UCLA, and Johns Hopkins University, where I worked, are beginning to unlock the mysteries of psychedelic substances. Psychedelics have been given to lifelong smokers and terminal cancer patients, people with incurable depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. And although the studies have been small and the findings are certainly not conclusive, the results are surprisingly consistent. People report deeply meaningful experiences with long-lasting improvements in well-being, reductions in psychological distress, and greater confidence in making positive life changes. Smokers are finally able to quit. Military vets are finally able to experience life without intrusive flashbacks, and cancer patients are no longer afraid to die. The compound we focused on at Hopkins was psilocybin, which is the main ingredient in a tiny, unassuming little mushroom that has been used for healing and spiritual exploration for thousands of years. These mushrooms grow wild all over the Pacific Northwest, including right here on Orcas Island. <laughs> the story of how so-called magic mushrooms made their way into the American consciousness begins with a woman named Maria Sabina from Oaxaca, Mexico. As the story goes, Maria was just a little girl when she wandered into the forest and found the mushrooms growing and ate them and made friends with the mushroom spirit. A few years later, when she was only eight years old, her uncle was dying, and none of the healers in the village could figure out what was wrong with him. So she ate the mushrooms again, and they told her what herb would cure her uncle. Over the years, Maria continued to practice her mushroom healing art until her life took an unexpected turn when she was 60 years old, and she shared the mushroom ceremony with foreigners for the first time. Gordon Wasson went on to write an article about his experience for Life magazine, popularizing the mushroom. And sent a sample to Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman, who had recently discovered LSD. Hoffman was able to isolate and synthesize the main psychoactive ingredient in the mushrooms, psilocybin. Which brings us to this tiny room, windowless room in Johns Hopkins University. Now, when I typically show people this image, it's not the first place they would choose to take a high dose of mushrooms. 
But since 2001, over 250 individuals have taken part in more than 600 psilocybin sessions in this room. And they've generally had a fantastic time. One of the most striking findings is that over 60% of our healthy volunteers report the kind of experience usually reserved for saints and mystics. A dissolving of boundaries between self and other, a dropping away of the normal constraints of time and space, a deeply felt, undeniable experience of connection with all things, and that warm, mushy, totally awesome feeling of being at home and completely at peace in your own skin. It's hard to believe, and even harder to describe, but let's just say you'd know it if it happened to you. During my time at Hopkins, I had the privilege of facilitating over 100 psychedelic sessions, and one of the most memorable was sitting with a 70-year-old Buddhist monk who was taking psilocybin for the first time. She had a beautiful experience, and in the days and weeks afterwards, she said that the loving kindness that permeated everything around her was more real and unmistakable than anything she'd experienced before, including after periods of long meditative retreat. What was most intriguing to me is that a third of our healthy volunteers claim to have experienced their own death. The first session that I facilitated where a volunteer had such an experience, he was kind of recounting how his journey had been going that whole day at the end of the day. And he kind of nonchalantly said, I think I died a few times. It wasn't a big deal. And afterward, I witnessed experiences that were more blissful and liberating, as well as experiences that were more like what I had gone through after the plane. Fear, confusion, intense perceptual distortions, all combined with desperate attempts to control or stop the experience. I can't be sure what happened to me during the year of the plane death. For a while, I thought it might be some kind of extended panic attack brought on by too much turbulence and too many 60-hour work weeks. Or maybe it was the meditation. Enlightenment is inherently a destructive process, and letting go of our self-centered attachments can feel like death. But I think it also had something to do with spending a whole lot of time in a tiny room with people taking high doses of psilocybin, as if my brain had been permanently rewired to expect transcendent experiences and death. So if my sense of reality had shifted so fundamentally just by being in the same room as our volunteers, I wondered how things were different for them. Once the afterglow had subsided and the drug effects had worn off, were they basically the same as before they took the plunge? I tried to tackle this question in my research by looking at changes in personality. And in psychology research, there's a gold standard measure of personality. It's 240 items, and it's a questionnaire that's been used in thousands of studies. And what researchers have found is that people solidify in, ter in terms of their personality by early adulthood, and they don't change much after that. So we had volunteers fill out the personality questionnaire at the beginning of the study at screening, and again, one or two months after each session. And what we found was that most of the personality traits stayed the same from before to after the high-dose experience. But one domain called openness to experience increased, and it stayed high for more than a year in people who'd had a mystical experience. This finding is unheard of in psychology research, and it's also great news because openness is correlated with all sorts of wonderful things like creativity and empathy and intelligence. People who are high in openness immerse themselves in art and music and have active imaginations. Openness is correlated with abstract problem solving and number of inventions and patents. And for what it's worth, Steve Jobs said that LSD was one of the most important things he did in his life. But this is good news even if you aren't looking to become the next Steve Jobs. In large-scale studies of how people change slowly over time, researchers have found that openness typically declines as we age. We become more rigid, more conservative, less creative, and less likely to try new things as we grow older. But people who show slight increases in openness report being happier and more satisfied with life. They experience more moments of awe and inspiration. So if psilocybin can reliably increase openness, it's like giving people a bit of their youthful innocence back like seeing through the eyes of a child. A little less than a year after the whole plane death craziness, I found myself sitting in a hospital room with my 29-year-old sister. All of the background anxiety and mental confusion I'd been struggling with had finally dissipated. I was lucid, and everything was clear. She was dying. Three years earlier, she'd been treated for an aggressive form of breast cancer and had been in great health ever since. But one day, she suddenly found she couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. She suffocated to death in a matter of weeks, while the doctors tried last-ditch interventions and promised her she had plenty of time left. In reality, she barely had time for two short visits with her four-year-old daughter in her hospital room. 
Our parents had less than 24 hours with her once the doctors admitted she was dying. The whole thing was horrific in all the ways you can imagine. But it was also spectacular. I had never seen anyone die before. I hadn't spent much time in hospitals and had never visited a hospice. But after all those crazy months of hanging out on the edge of life and death, I wasn't afraid. And I did exactly what I had been trained to do in all those psilocybin sessions. I held her hand, I breathed with her, I encouraged her to trust, let go, and be open. As much as I could, I got out of the way and let her have the death she needed to have. But when things got really tough, I was right with her, reminding her, you're safe, I'm here with you. And it worked. In the end, she died in peace, and she was free. For months afterward, I wasn't afraid of anything. I felt like a veil had been lifted. The world was shiny and new, vibrant and very, very real. I had that same experience the Buddhist monk described after her psilocybin session. Love was all around, palpable, flowing through everything and holding me up. And although it didn't last, I have a hunch that that version of reality has enormous healing potential. I wonder what our world would be like if more people could be that open and unafraid more of the time. I've seen some of the possibilities already, like when I volunteered with the Zendo Project at Burning Man in Africa Burn, helping people who are having intense psychedelic experiences. And in the work we're doing in New York City right now, where we've launched a new program that offers therapy and monthly drop-in groups for people who've had a psychedelic experience and need someone to talk to. Our hope being that people can learn how to weave and integrate these experiences into their daily lives. And of course, the research will continue slowly but surely. And there are even a few countries in the world where psychedelic plant medicines are already legal. But I imagine so much more. I imagine a world where no one has to go through what my sister and my family went through as she was dying. Instead of terrible ICUs, I envision great places to die, where family members and friends can take part in a sacred mushroom ceremony with their dying loved one. Places where young people can embark on a psychedelic vision quest to learn about death from the inside out and go on to help strangers who are dying and have no one to accompany them. I see places that honor death as a sacrament that is available to all of us. But what does all this mean for right here, right now? I suppose some of you are hoping I could offer up some grand epiphany from my year of living dangerously, <laughs> some neat and tidy resolution to the whole plain death extravaganza. But the truth is, I don't know how the story ends. And just like our psilocybin volunteers, I'm left with a fading memory of one of the most amazing, terrifying, and miraculous events of my life that is ultimately inexplicable. I could tell you a hundred more stories of how I saw people's lives change overnight after taking psilocybin for the first time, but it wouldn't be enough to convince the biggest skeptics among you. But I urge you, don't dismiss what I'm saying simply because it sounds far-fetched, or because you've been told that drugs are dangerous, or because you've been taught to fear the unknown. Consider that your very life is already psychedelic. It may not seem so most of the time, and it may not feel truly psychedelic until the final moments of your life, but I would argue that that's because of how you've been taught to pay attention. Most of us are so used to focusing on the ordinary, planned out, expected moments in our life that we miss the strange and mysterious detours. We've been taught since we were kids that the only things that are real are the things we can use language to name and our fingers to point to. We've been told to avoid the scary places in the world and the dark places in our minds. And we're so practiced in self-control and self-preservation that we can't even imagine what it might be like to open ourselves up to the magical and mystical realms of our natural world. And we've nearly obliterated the tools and traditions of our ancestors that might give us access. Thankfully, the mushrooms have not given up on us yet. It will be quite some time before we see a change in the law, and I don't think psilocybin is the path for everyone. But my hope is that the stories I've shared today will help you to search for the magic in your own life, to keep an eye out for those strange and mysterious detours, to maybe even walk right up to the edge and step into your fears. A wild and wonderful world is waiting for you. Thank you.